It's really a pleasure to be able to represent some of the work of the teams here at the Allen Institute for Brain Science at this symposium. Uh, this will not be a talk specifically about Alzheimer's disease, uh, because this is not actually what we study most of the time. There we go. Um, however, I think in the spirit of innovative technologies that could advance disease research, uh, hopefully some of the things that I'll have to share with you um, may ring a bell for other researchers in, in the um, audience. So, in fact, I'd like to motivate the talk a bit from the perspective of disease research. Uh, as I was thinking about the speakers that we had this morning, you know, we really live in a time where the scientific dialogue is dominated by ideas of conservation, conservation of genome sequences, conservation of cellular pathways, such that learning about yeast secretion pathways bears relevance on synaptic vesicle trafficking in, um, in neurons. And this leads us, I think, to uh, sort of a set of assumptions where we would like to think that this sort of stereotypy in conservation goes all the way up the chain to sort of system function. That the human brain, for example, is simply a scaled up mouse brain, a thousand times bigger mouse brain. And we have an assumption of sameness until proven otherwise. And this sounds great until you actually run into studying human disease. And then, then we run into problems where we don't see good translation and don't see good ability to use the mouse as a preclinical model system that translates well. This is true in a variety of biomedical disciplines. Here are just a few uh, in cancer. On the order of 8% of preclinical studies translate into the clinic. The record is actually pretty depressingly dismal on this front. So I think the question is, uh, why are we doing so poorly? And why are we lost in translation? So uh, I think here we know really very little, and in particular in the brain, we really don't know very many details about what in fact is different between the mouse and the human brain, for example. So there are lots of hints of what might be going on. Uh, a question posed about 100 years ago still remains unresolved. Do we actually have special neurons? or we simply have a lot more neurons. There are descriptions of differences in neuronal structures, for example, in dendritic spine complexity. There are examples of functional differences within cortical circuits. There are differences uh, in astrocytes. Astrocytes in human from the uh, Nadergaard lab have been shown to be uh, dramatically more complex and larger than humans compared to rodents. Uh, we have also shown uh, here, as have many others, differences in gene expression, uh, seemingly human-specific patterning of genes. Um, but again, our, our information here is really extremely incomplete. And it's clear, I think, that this assumption of sameness can't be taken for granted. We need more study of the human cortex, at the very least to serve as a benchmark for our model system, so we understand if our model systems are recapitulating the real system. Um, we also need new approaches that allow us to study human brain structure and function, uh, both in health and disease. So what I'd like to do in the first part of this talk is to give a little hint from our prior work of what we might expect to see on the basis of gene expression, where we can use our gene expression atlases to ask this question directly. What is the nature and frequency of differences that one sees across species? And then the second to talk about a suite of new techniques that we're using to try to study the human brain itself. So um, to sort of very briefly summarize the first 10 years or so of the Institute's existence, uh, we spent most of our effort in developing a series of gene expression atlases that in sum have created a transcriptional map or atlas of mammalian brain development. And the idea really was to take advantage of standardization of method, industrial scale, and a philosophy of open access to create a description of gene distribution across different structures of the brain, different cell types of the brain, across developmental stages, and also across species, where we've looked now in mouse, rhesus macaque, and human. And the sort of overlap of these creates this big data matrix where you can begin to look, in particular, salient for this talk, across species at the level of conservation of genes. So I'm just going to give a few very high level points to illustrate where I think we need to look and some of the 
sort of nature of this lost in translation, as I'll call it. Um, the first is that the gene expression really leads you to become a splitter. There are many, many cellular patterns that one sees that we haven't heard really anybody talk about something deeper than a neuron so far. There are many, many kinds of neurons. They're very genetically distinct. And I'll get to this later in single cell techniques. But this was sort of obvious from looking at gene expression patterns by in situ hybridization from the original Allen Brain Atlas, which is a description of all 20,000 genes in the adult mouse. Here you're looking at the barrel cortex or somatosensory cortex in the mouse. And you can see a whole series of genes that have very nice laminar specificity for all the different layers of the cortex. In fact, it turns out it's far more complex than this. As you start to look at the intersection of these genes, you see it becomes very combinatorially complex. But the point I want to make is that these genes are regulated at the level of cells, of course, but generalized at the level of cell types. And the gene expression data would suggest that this diversity is quite complex. In order to try to study the human brain, we couldn't take the same technique for lack of specimens, for the relatively limited information content you would get from a particular specimen, from the sheer size of the human brain. And so we had to take a different approach to utilize the tools of transcriptomics. At that time, microarrays, now uh, RNA sequencing is the method du jour, to sample across the cortex and sample across all of the subcortical regions that we could physically isolate to get sort of a mesoscale uh, analysis of the whole human brain. So it turns out that all of these omics strategies are very well suited to post-mortem types of material, provided the RNA quality is high. Uh, so you can, you can do a very systematic uh, survey using very high quality specimens. And so the, the output of this type of approach is a map. We have a map of about 1,000 different samples across the human brain where any given gene can be looked at for its specificity. Here are a set of genes associated with the dopamine signaling pathway. You can see that they're all expressed in very specific nuclei, as one would expect. And one can begin to look for patterning across the brain as a whole. So this one diagram here, uh, created by my colleague Mike Harlitz, looks at the differential gene expression between all of these different samples across the whole brain. And you can see from all the red here that there is a lot of differential gene usage across different parts of the brain. Some parts, at least sampled at this level of resolution, are quite homogeneous, like the cerebellum, like the neocortex. Certain parts of the cortex uh, seem quite distinct from other parts, such as primary visual cortex. But you can get, sort of get a gestalt here in sort of relative similarities. And one of the things that this sort of data set allows one to do is to look for sets of co-varying genes. So this is simply looking at genes that are different. We can also look for sets of genes that co-vary that might be sort of biologically important because of their co-regulation. Uh, there's a technique that uh, Steve Horvath at UCLA developed called weighted gene co-expression network analysis, which is very good at identifying these gene networks. And one of the very first things that became clear was that we could tease out a set of these modules or these patterns which actually account for the great majority of the variation at this sort of meso scale. And if you ask what do they likely do, it became very clear that many of these corresponded to particular cell types. Neurons, we heard about choroid plexus cells, um, microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, as well as different types of neurons. So a primary source of variation in the gene space is in the cell types. Even if you didn't sample at that level, you can get this from this, this type of patterning. Um, then one can ask, how well are these different modules conserved across species? And here was a little bit of a surprise, maybe not to the glial people in the audience, but uh, it, it turns out that the neuron-associated modules were better conserved than the glia-associated modules. In fact, some of these glia-associated modules were really quite poorly conserved uh, between mouse and human. Um, so that's one point I want you to take from this. The other is that for every one of these patterns, we would find genes that had substantially different patterns across species. Furthermore, they even shifted from one pattern to the next. So there are many genes that are actually sh shifting their cell type specificity that we can see in this sort of fashion. 
Uh, this is even um, clear when we take the next level of resolution down. So we have a, a set of genes for which we have looked across species using a cellular resolution assay in C2 hybridization, which allowed us then to look across species for the cellular distributions. You're looking just in the cortex here. And here, um, uh, to me, this was a bit of a surprise. That in many cases, we found very different cellular patterns between genes. This is one of my favorites here called prodynorphin, which is a pre-pro-opioid protein that's expressed in a very specific set of excitatory cells in both rhesus macaque and human, and expressed in inhibitory cells in mouse. Others shift layers. They shift part of their pattern and not others. But so the take home is, first of all, that these changes in regulation are happening at the level of cell types. One needs to be looking at this sort of level. And the second is that the magnitude of these differences is quite large. So on order, a quarter to a third of genes just in the cortex were showing differences in their cellular distribution across species. This is much greater than genomic uh, changes that we see between species. Uh, so the regulatory um, changes are, are uh, quite profound. This is also true in development. Uh, we're still sort of mining our development data sets, but we can find genes that have human-specific patterns, in some cases, totally opposite developmental trajectories. And if you sort of look for the degree of conservation, we see about 60% have conserved developmental trajectories, which means a lot don't have conserved developmental trajectories. So this was just meant to give a little flavor, but I want you to take home two messages here. The first is that there are a lot of differences across species. If we're looking for why things might not translate, part of it is probably right here, that there are many differences. And the second is that we probably need to take into account this level of specificity in thinking about this problem. Genes are regulated at the level of cell types, actually single cells. Um, and if we're looking at whole cortex or, God forbid, whole brain, we're going to miss all of these sorts of changes. OK. So the second part of the talk is heading for our more recent things. With the arrival of our eminent president, Christoph Koch, we have started on a new trajectory here which is really aiming to understand the structure and function of the neocortex, which we're approaching both in mouse and human. Uh, Christoph has conceptualized this problem, a la David Marr, as a tripart uh, conceptualization where we're looking for the components, the computations that are performed by those components, and cognition that is a consequence of those computations. You can think of this as sort of a reverse engineering of a device. Christoph always called this an iPhone, but in fact, it's a Samsung uh, that we're looking at here. Um, and with this vision, uh, we've been working to develop strategies about how to actually tackle this sort of problem. So um, on the component side, our first sort of question is, what are the components? Uh, which we're trying to understand what the different phenotypes of cells are that could be captured as a way to quantitatively define the cellular taxonomy of types, if you will. Once we understand the types, we can begin to understand how they are connected into circuits. They get the wiring diagram. And then, based on this cellular taxonomy, we'd like to be able to develop tools to allow one to have access to those cellular components and be able to manipulate them. In the case of mouse, this is, of course, Cree lines to be able to target particular cell types. In the case of human, there really is very little available right now. But as I'll tell you in a little bit, we think that a reasonable strategy is to go after viral transfection or transduction of cells uh, to allow you to introduce transgenes into specific cellular components in living human tissues, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, breaking this down one step further, the sort of tactical approach of going after this, we've defined a set of these phenotypes, and we're trying to develop ways to be able to generate quantitative data in high throughput to be able to derive a classification of types based on those different data types. Um, in particular, the ones I'll talk about are uh, the transcriptome, the morphology and the physiology of cells. And for those of you that are interested in the synaptomic part, I think Stephen Smith is in the audience and would be more than happy to 
expound on that topic. So, um, so I I'm going to go through these sort of uh, one by one here um, with the idea that we're, we're really aiming to develop techniques that can be harnessed in both mouse and human to be able to derive the different cell types of the cortex. And I'd like to sort of uh, put this in the context of the field right now, where neuroscience tends to come last to these sorts of things, but we're, we're sort of in the midst, I think, uh, of a revolution in single cell transcriptomics, where all of a sudden, these methods that we've been applying at more of this meso scale are applicable at the level of individual cells. And the techniques themselves are scalable, such that they're actually up to the task of dealing with very complex tissues like brain tissues. So there have been a, a slew of recent papers beginning to apply these single cell techniques to uh, neuronal systems, the retina, the neocortex, and uh, in particular, I'd like to highlight a study that was done here by, uh, by my colleagues, Basil Kitasik, uh, Hong Kui Zheng, among others, uh, trying to harness this single cell approach to look at the mouse neocortex, mouse primary visual cortex. And essentially, what the technique allows you to do is to isolate populations of cells and for each cell to generate a complete transcriptome of that cell. So in the case of the study that was just recently published in Nature Neuroscience, we took advantage of the various Cree lines that we had um, at our disposal to isolate the labeled cell populations through microdissection, protease treatment, and trituration, fact sort them, and then use these for sequencing. And the output of this is a rather remarkable thing, actually. In one fell swoop, looking at this whole population of cells, we were able to classify more than 40 types. So 49 types of cells, transcriptomic types of cells, I should say, were identified from about 1,600 input cells that represented, on the one hand, non-neuronal cells, on the other, a large cohort of um, excitatory and inhibitory cells, where uh, the breakdown of these cells matches very well what we, there's the mouse moving around, uh, what we know uh, about the different cell types of the cortex already. And furthermore, uh, the structure of this hierarchy is one that reflects the developmental origin of these cells. So for example, the inhibitory cells, which are derived from the ganglionic eminences, are all on one branch, and then you can see the cells that are coming from different germinal zones within the ganglionic eminences grouping together. So the, the adult patterning reflects the developmental ontogeny of these cells. So the question is, can this type of methodology be applied to the human cortex? And here, things get a little bit more challenging. Um, on the one hand, there has now been a published study looking at single cell transcriptomes from human cortex, taking a, a biopsy and isolating cells. But the challenge with this is that neurons don't survive this process very well at all. And so this isn't really sort of broadly applicable to human cortex um, because you can't isolate the neurons. They just don't tolerate that sort of treatment in the adult cortex. On the other hand, uh, another innovative approach uh, that Rusty is actually an author on, uh, coming from Roger Laskin at the Craig Venser Institute, is instead to try to sequence just the RNA that's present in the nucleus of cells. The nuclear membrane is much more robust. One can actually isolate nuclei from banked post-mortem material or fresh tissue and isolate large populations of cells. There doesn't seem to be a giant bias in which kinds of cells are isolated in such a way. So although there's only on the order of a tenth to a hundredth of the RNA in the nucleus, the distribution seems to be quite similar to what's in the cell as a whole, and this offers an, a novel approach to go after this problem. So in fact, this is what we've been pursuing in collaboration uh, with Roger's lab and also with Illumina, where we now have methods that work where we can um, take a whole human brain, we can take slabs from this brain, this can be frozen for um, as long as you want, we can isolate um, sections from these, we can then stain them, we can dissect out layers even, and then we can isolate cells or so isolate nuclei RNA, make libraries, and sequence them. And at least sort of in our preliminary studies here, it's looking like we're able to detect 
something similar to the diversity of cells that we're seeing in the mouse, although it takes much larger numbers of cells to really convince yourself and do this de novo. But we're able to differentiate glia from excitatory cells from interneurons, and within each of these classes, differentiate groups within them corresponding to these major groups. So this really could be kind of a breakthrough technology that allows you to really go after the molecular patterning of the cortex, the cell type diversity, and one could easily imagine now applying this to disease where you're looking for cell type specific genetic changes associated with that disease. The other main development in the cell type arena in the cortex recently has been the use of physiology and anatomy as a way of trying to derive a taxonomy or a classification of cell types. Uh, there have been two major papers recently, one from Henry Markham's group, um, trying to do sort of systematic, large-scale analysis of patch-clamped cells, which you fill with biocytin, and then to derive a grouping based on their anatomy and their intrinsic membrane properties. Um, the other was from Andreas Tullius. So can we do this in human as well? Well, in fact, there's precedent for this. Uh, there are two main groups in Europe that have been doing systematic patch clamp physiology of neurons from cortical slices that were derived from neurosurgically resected tissue following epilepsy and or tumor removal surgeries. And in both cases, not only have they demonstrated that this is a feasible thing to do, uh, but they've also begun to identify features of their properties which are different between rodents and humans. And so we have endeavored to try to set up a similar thing here in Seattle. Um, and in fact, we have been extremely fortunate to have a series of local neurosurgeon colleagues who have been willing to help us to try to get this off the ground. At uh, University of Washington, Jeff Ogeman and Andrew Koh, and at Swedish Medical Center, Ryder Gwynn and Charles Cobbs, um, have been helping to supply us with tissue to begin to try this, and it turns out to be remarkably successful. We were able to take a piece of cortex which is resected in the process of one of these two types of surgeries. We can bring this sugar cube, as Christoph called it earlier today, back to the lab, vibratome section it into sections perpendicular to the plane of the cortex so we can see all of the layers. And a very talented scientist in my group, Jonathan Ting, has helped to pioneer some of these methods to be able to record from these cells and then to fill them uh, to look at their anatomy. And besides the fact that one can do this quite routinely, one of the big surprises from this sort of approach early has been that these slices are very viable. We're able to keep these alive for days, uh, both in ACSF normally and then putting them in culture for longer. You're looking at recordings from cells here 30 hours post-surgery, 48 hours post-surgery, and 66 hours post-sectioning here. So, these neurons uh, are able to survive for quite a long time, much longer than one can do in a mouse, piece of mouse cortex. Um, and this opens up all sorts of possibilities for being able to do routine recording and potentially uh, also molecular genetic manipulation. So we've now actually begun a pipeline for this, by which I mean that we have a, a team whose job is to take either mouse or human tissue to slice this tissue, and then to do a very standardized recording and filling to allow one to generate data that supports modeling of these cells and supports morphological reconstruction of their anatomies so that we can both try to generate models of these and also ultimately build sort of a quantitative uh, classification of types based on these different properties. Um, in the human, well, I should say in the mouse, we make a big effort to try to map all of these data back into a reference atlas for that mouse to create a, a common coordinate framework to organize all of this data. This is a little bit more challenging with the human data, and so we're trying to deal with this by mapping at two levels. We're trying to map back to an MRI coordinate space, MNI coordinate space, at the level of, of the donor, and also an exact laminar position at the level of the slice from which it was taken. And then also to try to relate this in some way to the state of the tissue. It should be understood that all of these tissues are from pathological individuals, 
we try to avoid the actual pathological tissue, but nevertheless, uh, we don't really know much about the provenance of the tissue, and so we're actually trying to collect some data that allows a bit of neuropathology on that exact individual, which over time will allow us to look at variation across space and also variation that relates to the disease of the individual. Uh, this is now going quite well. Um, here are some example traces from pyramidal neurons in different layers. They give very healthy spiking protocols. The cells look very healthy, and we're able to fill and reconstruct these cells. And then we have a modeling team that's building biophysical models uh, to try to um, capture the physiological properties of these cells. OK. Um, I should say that similar to our earlier atlases, we're also making all of these data available to the community. Uh, we have already released some of the mouse data. Uh, the first release was uh, last May, and actually later this week we're having another update from this uh, for this cell types database as well, so that hopefully the whole community can actually look at these and come to their own conclusions about classifications of types. Okay. Um, the last thing about these human slices is that the viability of these slices, keeping these alive for three to five days, puts this really in the realm of being able to do targeted manipulative studies in human tissues. And what we've been trying to do is to develop viral techniques to be able to do rapid infection and introduction of transgenes into human neurons so that we can actually study specific types of neurons. What you're seeing here is uh, examples of filled cells. You can see the huge dendritic spines on these human neurons here labeled with the fluorescence and recording from these cells uh, days after infection. So um, the technique seems to be fine. The, the viruses without cell type specificity work very well. They introduce high levels of transgenes and it actually opens us up as a model system where we can actually study the actual human cortex. I'll leave this point on one last one, which is uh, that at least at this point, I think this is the first uh, human channel rhodopsin experiment uh, that's been shown that we actually have introduced uh, channel rhodopsin 2 into slices. Again, this is the work of Jonathan Ting. Um, and you can see the fluorescent cell. You can record from it. You can stimulate with blue light. And you can see here's an example of a fast spiking interneuron stimulated to fire with blue light or with a current pulse pyramidal neuron with the same thing. So the techniques work. The tools themselves are species agnostic. Uh, and if we can introduce cell type specificity to this approach, uh, we've got a real system akin to what one can do in the mouse. So um, in closing, I'd like to point out that these different sorts of techniques and platforms are very applicable to studying disease as well. And in fact, we have worked uh, to use these different platforms over time to take stabs at different diseases. Um, for example, the in situ hybridization platform that we initially developed, we used to study autism and schizophrenia. The transcriptomics platform for the adult human brain atlas is one that we have used, in fact, are using right now in a collaborative study that I'll mention on the next slide to study aging dementia and TBI. And perhaps this would stimulate some of you to imagine some of the things that one could do to study Alzheimer's disease using these different single cell and local circuit sorts of studies. So um, this is really mostly a plug, not a, not a, a detailed description. But we've had a, a wonderful collaboration with several people in the audience here um, to study the, um, initially this study was actually set out to look at the long-term effects of traumatic brain injury. But in fact, this is a data set which also can be used to study normal aging and the onset of dementia uh, in the context of aging, where we coupled together the skills and talents of three different groups here. Group Health, who have, been, um, have an ongoing study called ACT, or Adult Changes in Thought, which is a long-term cohort to collect individuals who are non-demented, who then agree to be tested over time and pre-consent for their, their brains later. Um, and the neuropath um, skills of Dirk Keen, and then our transcriptomic platform to sort of try to create a very comprehensive look 
at the progression um, and onset of, um, of dementia in several different brain regions where we look at a whole series of different things. We look at the quantitative neuropathology. We look at the transcriptome and various molecular components. We look at cellular resolution gene expression coupled with all of the metadata associated with ind these individuals to create a big data cube that we can now really look at the relationship among all these different variables as they relate to dementia. And uh, this data is actually going to be publicly accessible on Thursday. And I wanted to make a plug for this resource because this is a key audience for this, I think. And hopefully many of you can get value from this. So with that, I will end. Uh, first, I would like to thank our various local clinical colleagues, in particular our surgeons from the University of Washington and Swedish Hospital. And as I just mentioned, uh, Rich Ellenbogen, Dirk Keen, Paul Crane, Eric Larson uh, for a terrific collaboration on that last project. And then it's sadly not really possible to adequately thank the many, many people that are involved in these big team projects. So I have to give one collective thanks to the entire team and also to Paul and Jody Allen for their vision and their support of these innovative techniques to look at the human brain. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Rusty? That's great. Thanks, Ed. Have you <clears throat> had an opportunity to take a biopsy from the same area that you get the autopsy material? So what I'm, what I'm, what I'd like you to see if you have data for us to take the same area and do single cell transcriptomics on post-mortem tissue versus live tissue and try to isolate the same cells to see how well the post-mortem tissue or what, what are the differences between the cells that we've been getting from post-mortem tissue and doing RNA-seq versus your, your now amazing resource of live tissue for a variety of reasons, but just if you could have any insight on the fidelity of the transcriptome for... Yeah, it's a great question that I would say it's a bit preliminary to for us to ask at this point. Uh, we're just getting going on deciding what the appropriate technique to throw at this is, and in fact, whether we should use postmortem or autopsy tissue uh, for that matter. One is higher quality, but came from a, a surgery. The other is perhaps not as high quality, but you could pick whatever brain region you wanted. Um, the, the challenge with these is controlling variability. There are so many sources of variability that those tend to be very hard experiments to do. Are you proposing to take a piece from the living individual uh, before and after surgery, or no? So no, I mean just the same region because you're, you're, yeah. presumably there'll be some presumably there'll be some generalizability of the of the signature from certain subregions, and if they're holding up, you may be able to get some information about the, the dynamics of the signature in those specific layers better in the postmortem tissue, but see how well they represent what's actually happening in living tissue. Yeah, it's a great question. We, we definitely need to take a closer look at that. Just to follow up on that question, I had the same question. But when you do this, uh, there's another variable that's very important besides postmortem interval. And that's the degree and the uh, extent of agonal state. So people are dying gradually, depending upon what the uh, pathology is with electrolyte imbalances. So you could have the same postmortem time, but you had dramatic changes, I would think, in gene expression. So it's that you have maybe in part of your metadata to get some handle on that uh, would be good. Of course, you could try your mouse brain uh, as, as a, a, a pilot study, but then you'd have to impose comparable kinds of agonal states with them. Not such an easy thing to do. Yeah. But, I mean, this is an issue that we have dealt with from the first time that we started doing human tissue. Uh, early on, our, basically what we decided to do is to look at a, a small number of very high quality specimens and kind of avoid the problem a little bit by having picked very, very high quality ones. Um, but the thing is that how can, you, how can you control this other than doing very large numbers in humans? It's a very challenging thing to actually go after because you can't 
you can't really control this very well. You could imagine doing this in a model organism where you can vary what happened to them prior to death, uh, perhaps more, more carefully. Um, so I, th I think the best that we can do right now is to try to characterize each specimen quite carefully and over time see whether there is some sort of a covariate with other features that we're seeing. But I'd be happy if you have other suggestions. You talked about the problem in translation, these mouse studies to human disease cures. Um, in terms of the resolution, single cell resolution of individual genes, have you or anyone else looked at differences between humans and mice for specific neurodegenerative disease genes, for example, tau or APP? Are there differences in the pattern of expression or the level of expression um, to help explain why these studies haven't translated? Yeah, so the short answer is no. Um, we have the data for whoever would like to do it, uh, but we haven't actually had that as a top theme on the list. Um, but I would encourage you, if you're interested in that, this is all publicly available, and it's ripe for a graduate student to take a look at.